Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our coming Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, at one of the many beautiful lakes we have up north of us, I remember reading an article, a story about a magnificent home that was built on a lot that had this spectacular view of the lake. I mean, this house was mammoth. It literally cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to build. And when you add in the cost of the beautiful lakefront lot that it sat upon, it was unquestionably a home worth several million dollars. Therefore, you could truly say it had a million dollar view. However, the irony of this lake home was after it had been built, the owner could not move into it. You see, this enormous structure was so tall that it ended up blocking the neighbor's view of the lake. The neighbors sued, and they won their case. Consequently, before the owner could <clears throat> take occupancy of their brand new colossal lake home, they had to lower its height. Now the reason I share that story with you is because when it comes to building homes, people really work hard, do they not, at getting that, quote, best view. Well, you know something, my friends, in a similar way, when it comes to spirituality, People will often do the same thing. That is, they will work hard at getting the best view of God. And as a result of that, we have a real diverse spiritual scene out there in our world today. We have many claiming to have the right view. That is, the best view of true religion. And if you're not really well grounded in your faith, why, it can all be rather confusing, to say the least. Well, in the midst of that confusion, I'd like you to listen again to what the prophet Isaiah said in our Old Testament reading. He said, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will will stream to it. You know, in order to really appreciate what Isaiah is saying there in that verse, it, it might be helpful to know that back in Isaiah's day, people would set up these altars to the false deities that they worshipped, and they would set them up on the top of hills or mountains. In the Bible, these altars are sometimes referred to as, quote, high places. And the idea of a high place, according to the pagan mindset of that time, was that the elevation of these altars, why that meant status. The higher the altar was, the more impressive it appeared, the more powerful the God to which it worshipped would be. As you read through the Old Testament, you quickly discover that starting with King Solomon, there was an attraction, you might say, to these high places. For instance, in 1 Kings chapter 11, it says, On the hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. Or, as it states in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, King Jehoram, it quote says, had also built high places on the hills of Judah and had caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves. Dear friends, this fascination that the, the leaders and the people of Israel had with these high places eventually led to not only outright idolatry, of course, but also to an even more spiritually damaging virus that is sometimes called syncretism. 
You know what syncretism is? Not every dictionary, I notice, has that word listed. But basically, syncretism is the melding together of different religious beliefs and practices. It's not an outright denial of the true God of Holy Scripture, per se, but rather it's an attempt to take a little bit of the best from a number of different belief systems. Many of the Israelites were guilty of syncretism back in Isaiah's day, and you know something? Many modern Americans are also guilty of syncretism today. For you see, even in our culture today, it's not uncommon to encounter someone who says that, yeah, I'm a Christian. But in reality, they have fabricated their own belief system by taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that from other belief systems out there. It would not be uncommon, for instance, to encounter a person who has taken certain ritual practices from, say, something like Zen Buddhism, and then other practices from the Roman Catholic faith, which they grew up with. And they may incorporate a, a bit of doctrine that they learned from a Lutheran friend, and a bit more from a New Age novel that they had just read. Perhaps they will even hold to some ethical principles that they learned from their favorite TV series. They might throw a little astrology in there as well. With syncretism, the overriding question is not whether or not something is true, but rather whether or not it works. That is, whether or not it fits into one's perception of what spirituality ought to be like. The spiritual mindset of today is, look, if something fits into my belief system, then great. I'll incorporate it into my beliefs. And if it doesn't fit, well, well, maybe somebody else can benefit from it, so we shouldn't knock it. After all, who are we to say we're right and they're wrong? Well, my friends, in the midst of syncretism like that, the God of Scriptures reminds us through the prophet Isaiah that the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief. Chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. In other words, in that particular verse, we are reminded of the supremacy. Yes, the absolute supremacy of the God of Israel. That he is not simply, you know, one among many gods out there, but he is in fact the one and only true God. And there are no others that even come close to him. But you know, there's something interesting about this mountain of the Lord's temple here that I, Isaiah speaks of. This mountain is supposed to be, as it says there, chief, Right? It is to rise above all others. Well, you know something from a strictly physical perspective. That is, if you just take a look at the topography of the land there in Israel, the actual temple of the Lord, as magnificent as it was, well, it was not built on the highest point, the highest hill or, or mountain in the Jerusalem area. Now, it's interesting to note that the temple mount on which the temple sat was actually lower in elevation than the surrounding hills there in Jerusalem. For instance, the Mount of Olives, which sits just opposite of the temple mount to the east there, is a much higher elevation. Now, I realize no one asked me but in my opinion, it would have been much more impressive to build the temple up there on the Mount of Olives or up on any of the higher elevations in the area of Jerusalem instead of building it where it ended up being built. Clearly, those other places would seem to be more prominent places for the temple 
of the one and only true God. But the fact is, nobody did ask me, nor did God, and he chose to have his temple built on a hill of much smaller stature than that of the surrounding hills in Jerusalem. But why? Why? Well, my friends, because, well, because that's the way the God of Scripture chooses to do things. In his kingdom, in his kingdom, the Scriptures remind us, it is the least who will be the greatest, and it is the last who will be first, right? That's how it was, you recall, with the coming of the Messiah at his first advent, his first coming. In terms of the Messiah, people were looking for something more eye-catching, something more conspicuous, something of greater stature and magnificence. And yet, how did God bring about his kingdom? How did he usher it in? In the most humble way possible. With a baby. And not just any baby either. But one born in a stable. A stable his parents didn't even own. A baby lying in a manger. Have you ever wondered as I do, why does God, why does God do that? Why does he choose to use humble means like that to accomplish his great and majestic work. Well, think of it this way, which is really more impressive. Seeing a hopelessly poor man raised from his poverty to great wealth, or seeing a wealthy man trying to outdo himself. Obviously, the more impressive sight is that of seeing one raised from, from rags to riches. Well, my friends, that's exactly what God has done in your life and in my life. Through his son, God has raised us from the depths of sin and death. And he has bestowed upon us all the riches of heaven. Ours is truly a rags to riches story. As the Apostle Paul points out in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where he writes there, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. That's why Jesus equates his suffering and his death on the cross is actually bringing glory to God because only God can take something as abhorrent as a cross and bring good from it as he surely did. And of course the good he brought from the cross was nothing less than yours and my salvation. Dear friends, the mountain and the temple here that Isaiah speaks of in this Old Testament reading, well, it's not actually referring to a physical piece of real estate. That's important for us to understand. Rather, Isaiah is referring to what life in God's kingdom is like. And take a look, if you would, for a minute at that Old Testament reading again. There are three things about God's kingdom that Isaiah points out to us here. First of all, in the middle of verse 3, it says, He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. What that means is, as citizens of God's kingdom, we will receive perfect instruction from the Lord. In other words, we will know the will of the Lord with perfect clarity. All of our questions will be satisfied. All of our doubts will be met. Secondly, in the kingdom of God, there will be no more war or strife. It says in verse 4, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation will not take up sword against a nation, nor will they train for war anymore. You see, all the instruments of warfare will be transformed into instruments of peace. And then thirdly there, the implication of the absence of war and strife is that believers from every nation around the globe will be unified together. Unified such that there won't even be a hint of division among God's people. Not a hint. Now tell me, does that describe the kingdom of God as you and I know it right now? Well, the answer to that is both a yes and a no. You see, on one hand, because sin is still with us, because it clings to these bodies of ours, as the Apostle Paul tells us, we are going to struggle with understanding the Lord's perfect instruction, His perfect will for our lives. It may not always be so clear to us as we would like for it to be because of sin. And as a result, we will still experience in our lives war and strife, and sadly, division and discord will plague us in this life. However, on the other hand, Isaiah gives to us here another view of things. Indeed, a much better view of things. He gives to us a view of hope. Christian hope, we might call it. And that view is ours through faith in the coming Messiah. Yes, through faith in Jesus Christ, friends, we have the best view of all. Because, you see, he defeated the sin, the death that obstructs our view of God. Through his death and resurrection, we can now see clearly God's great and magnificent love for us and for all people. And you know that love motivates us to then respond, as verse 5 here indicates, to walk now in the light of the Lord. And that is what we do this Advent season that we begin here today. That's what we do throughout our earthly lives. We walk. We walk in faith. We walk in the light of the Lord. For you see, His light illuminates, above all, the way of salvation as we travel through this sin-stained world. And therefore, His light gives to us the best view of all. And that indeed is what we have in Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.